All right, I'm going to go through every single film that I watch every year. So I've given this a lot of thought and thought about all the different movies. And if any movie, if there's any question that I don't watch it every year, I watch it maybe twice every three years or something like that. If there's any question, I've, I've left it off the list. So all the movies on this list are definite films that I watch every single year. Sometimes, some of them more than once, as you'll see. So these are, and, and these are features. That's the way I worded it in the uh, title here. So features, as you know, when I list feature presentations... It's either full-length movies, or it's short films, or it's even TV shows. So anything that can be found on IMDb, it's kind of the IMDb rule that's listed there. It just counts as a feature, no matter what type it is. So, and these films are ones that are that I have on VHS, uh, some DVD, no Blu-ray, of course. Um, Quite a bit of ones that I've burned off of the internet onto a DVD, a blank DVD. Some are available on YouTube, and some are available... Uh, there's maybe a few that are available on Tubi.com only. And there's maybe at least one that I can think of that I have downloaded to my computer... I haven't done many of those, maybe maybe two or three. And um, I'm going to go through by month, okay? So a lot of these are watched in specific months of the year because I'm very, like, I go with weather and, and films, and that's the thing that I really tie in with movies, how they fit with uh, what's going on outside, kind of, in the feel. And a lot of it connects with the movies themselves. That's why when I would ask for uh, uh, trivia winners to pick my feature, uh, Slick was very good at asking, what's the weather? Because she knew that I went by that a lot. Uh, now, some of them are going to be not really specific to a month. Most of them are, but I'll go through and I'll kind of explain that part of it. That's going to be the main explanation of why they are and why they are watched in certain months. And I won't get too much into the movies, in like reviewing the movies or anything like that. Uh, so when I talk about the year, I thought about there's a couple of, there's a few different ways to go through this you can do start with the uh with just the regular the julian calendar of january to december certainly um you could do the other one that i thought of was maybe starting at like arca and then going through to like mid october that being the end the other one the one that i landed on Orion calendar of features. Okay, and I felt like that was the best. You can make an argument for the others, but I felt like that was the that's kind of the feel. The beginning of feature of the features, uh, the year begins kind of in to me mostly begins kind of in the that mid to late March period and goes from there. And then it ends sort of early to mid-March, and I'll kind of explain that as I go, okay? Also, if anyone uh, is able to sit through all this, I'd also like for you to comment, either in the comment section or uh, in on Wire Club, just, you know, if you've, not just if you've seen any of these, if you watch any of these every year, but if you've 
at least seen one of them, you know, many times. Like, oh, I, I love that too. Or if you're like, see one where you're like, I can't believe you watch that terrible movie every year. So we're going to begin in that mid to, lo to late March period. Okay. And um, the first one is not any Star Wars film. Okay. Sorry to disappoint you, Darth, but I, I don't watch Star Wars films every year. So probably the one that kicks off the year, not officially, but probably the first one that I watch to begin the year is one called Terror at Red Wolf in 1972. Horror, kind of dark comedy. It's cannibal, cannibalistic film. A lot of it is um, it's, it's about... Uh, set, uh, 77 minutes or so there's a lot of weird scenes in this and a lot, a lot of the time is chewed up with these people sitting around the table eating because these these two here are trying to fatten up the guests to uh, eat them and the the girl at the beginning gets a letter from them to go it's like during spring break she's in college so it's kind of that uh that's how it fits into that mid to late uh, March period that spring at least that was spring break for um, where I went to school so this is one that it's a new entry uh, it, it was I've watched it at the beginning of the, uh, the pandemic around the same time two years ago and I'll definitely watch it again all right let's go to the next one all right the next one is 1978's the alpha incident just like the previous one, one that I discovered two years ago, right during the beginning of the pandemic, and this one has John Goff and uh, Buck Flower, and it, you can kind of you can kind of browse through the plot there. It, it's very much like a uh, like there, you know, it fit into that whole virus thing, so it's very similar to like something that could happen like that, and it's a uh, I absolutely love this this film, sci-fi, schlock, 70s, but it's a very good premise. It may have been done, something like that before I've read, but I, I forget the, the other movie that was similar to this, but this is a very good watch. I like the exchanges between the actors, and it feels kind of like spring. It feels kind of like a, a uh, not spring, but... You know, kind of that kind of that late March feeling to it, and it kind of just reminds me of that beginning time of the pandemic, doomsday drama. Great movie. Next one is called Contamination, nineteen eighty. Feels like it's more of a late seventies movie. Probably filmed a couple of years before. Another one off of that same DVD set that I discovered around March twenty twenty. And it's just one I'm I plan on watching again and again every year. Uh, also has some kind of uh, virus type things going on in it. Look it up. It's West German Italians. You've got some voiceovers, which I love. They go to South America to search for this flesh-eating thing. And it's just a really good movie. It's something that you can imagine, just like the Alpha Incident, being remade because it has really good ideas. I wouldn't watch the remake, but still, a uh, very, very fun watch. It's uh, the kind of thing you could also slide into Horror Fest. Time Chasers, 1994. This one doesn't have to be in March. It can be almost any time of year, really. But I do watch this every year. It's a, it's a cult classic. Uh, I watch it with the MST3K commentary, of course. It's one of the... It's one of the most uh, celebrated of the MST3K. Time Chasers, a time travel, bad time travel film, a lot of funny commentary. All right, so we move into April, and this is one that, this is maybe the only one that I have, that I only watched, uh, downloaded to my computer. The movie poster leads you to believe it's just another Typical 80s slasher movie, but it's not. It has some slasher elements, but it's more of a it's more of a mystery, a uh, little comedy too, and it's one that uh, I uh, on 
YouTube OCP Communications did a great review of this back in I think 2019 and I will post the link to that if I can remember this is one that's obviously watched on the day of and they are also on a spring break similar to that red terror at red wolf in so it fits in nicely april fool's day weekend and it is an absolute this one never gets old this is one of my favorite this is just one of my favorite movies uh 1986 I also want to add that this was the first one that I rented at the video store over 10 years ago. This and Slumber Party Massacre, I rented them both and watched them watched them both. And one of the main reasons I got it was because it had Jenny Steele right there, uh, who was the last girl in Friday the 13th Part 2. She's the last girl in this too. Next we have a 50-minute sh uh, short film. Christian film and get ready because you're going to see a lot of these and, and most of them are by this man right here and I like this so much that I have the VHS and the DVD the DVD has the uh, has the Spanish voiceovers that's the only like special feature on it this is just one that I lucked out and found at a thrift store one time and it just looked like eh, this could be pretty bad and it, sure enough it was the music uh, you can kind of look at the glance over the plot there, but this thing, this is one that just never gets old. This is one that I can watch a couple times a year, just the, um, the dialogue. It feels like spring. The music is bad. Yeah, it has a spring, like, outside the high school. It just kind of has that spring feeling, but it doesn't have to be in April. It can be, I don't know, almost any month except for winter months. Alright, another one I'll, I'll throw in there. This could be March, this could be April, this could be May. I just didn't have a spot for it, so I just threw it in there. The Daylight Zone, 1986. I believe this was the first Rich Cristiano film that he did. Another short Christian film, kind of a little take off of the Twilight Zone. You can see the... Yeah, there's the plot right there. And, you know, it's just another... Another good one that I I like to watch. The guy gets a fish sandwich and a Mountain Dew, which um, I kind of like to focus on the food in these movies too. But uh, something kind of like eat after watching this. A good a good one when you don't have much time for a feature. The Daylight Zone, and this one is one that's against all hope. Nineteen eighty two. This is one that is definitely watched around. The spring break period, like a little before Easter, kind of in there. Every year. This is one I kind of just stumbled upon in a, a thrift store, and I was like, I don't think I'm going to like this. Michael Madsen, it's his first movie. You're familiar with him. Kill Bill and Reservoir Dogs and that kind of kind of garbage. But you can see the, uh, the plot right there, and there's a picture right there now there's a thanksgiving scene in this movie so yeah i mean you could watch it in november but it's uh mostly feels like spring it's a so it starts with him uh calling up a priest because he's a struggling alcoholic and his his family life has gone bad and then he t he's talking to the priest kind of about his life so he kind of the whole movie is kind of him going through his life and they're showing back flashes stuff how he got into booze and things happened with his family and uh it was produced by a guy named edward d mcdougall who the only other movie i've seen him, by him was called never ashamed which i have also this one is uh yeah full length a 90 minute minute movie it's a it's very different christian film it's not like the, the cristiano ones and it has a real it has a real weird, the copy of it is, is real uh, kind of cloudy, kind of grainy, which I, I like a lot. It has some scenes that are kind of funny, like him going to the bar and stuff, and like selling his, <laughs> selling his kids, uh, instead of getting medicine for his kid, he like 
sells off a toaster or something to get some more booze. And it's just, um, I just really, it's really one that grows on me, and I, I, I watch it every year. So against all hope. The Idaho Transfer from 1973. This one is another one off that DVD with Red, Terror and Red Wolf in, Contamination, etc. Another one with with a outstanding premise, but you know it has some flaws, and it wasn't it wasn't much money put into this. It's just another one of those things you could see it being remade and done really well. But it was done really well for what it was. Directed by uh, Peter Fonda. He's not in it, but there's a young Keith Carradine in this. And I just think it's really inventive the way they do the... It's a time travel movie. And the way... Yeah, just the way they set up the whole, the quote, time machine. And there's just this real rocky terrain in the future. Yeah, there's like the little tunnel that they come out of in the future. And it's just really... It's scary. And it's... Uh, there's like this dusty stuff in there. Like they stumble upon, upon this dusty car. I think there was some kind of nuke that happened. I forget what year this is, but uh, the characters are all very unlikable. Okay, so it's 2034, and these college age kids are like sent into the future to restart civilization or something. And uh, I think it's just really well done. This is that's a this could be in May. That's kind of more of a May feeling to it. Yeah, Idaho Transfer, one of the underrated time travel movies of all time. All right, let's go to May. Kind of a slow month. Things start to slow down a little bit. Probably slide that Idaho Transfer into May. Just kind of makes more sense. But So I just have four here I'm going to highlight because I do watch all four of these every year. Not necessarily May, but they can certainly fit in there. This is the one that I mentioned before. Edward T. McDougall film, the follow-up to Against All Hope, Never Ashamed. Um, this one's a, a little better, a little a little slicker than, than Never Ashamed. And uh, he, comes, he comes back from a summer camp experience. So it could be, this could probably fit more into the, the fall, but there is a scene where they go, where he goes to uh, watch a Cubs game. <laughs> With like a, a youth director or something, but this is just one. Yeah, it's a it's a short one, sixty two minutes. A kind of a long short one. No name actors, of course. None of these actors are known at all. Okay, and then this is that one off the that three short film DVD set and Crime of the Age. I watch this every year too. A mystery, a Christian mystery film. Uh, this one is uh, 32 minutes. This is from 1988. And this has the same guy, Keith Salter, from The Daylight Zone. So just another just another one that... It's, it's a repetitive film, but... Um, it's, a, it's a camp film, so it should be more of a summer film. But I never seem to watch it in the summer. I don't know why. I've even looked up the place where this was filmed. It's pre that's pretty sad. And there's a scene where the, all the counselors at the end where they're eating, uh, they're having a pizza dinner. So this is uh, should be followed up with pizza. Next is another Rich Cristiano, Late One Night, 2000 and, uh, 2001. I always think it's 2002. This is one of the better ones that Cristiano directed. It's a 33-minute uh, film, and it's, it's, it's a good drama. It all... Most of it takes place in a little diner place, and uh, this guy, not here, but this guy right here orders a, uh, this is all you need to know, this guy <laughs> orders a uh, chicken sandwich and fries, so I usually, I usually do the same following this, this feature. It's a good, it's more of a serious type of film, but I just kind of like that location, that little diner. Um, another good watch if you don't have much time for a full length. And then finally, this one is like a usually a spring or fall, and you've probably seen me post this as my feature many, many times. Like not again in your wildest dreams, feature film for families. This is not a Christian film. This is a this is a moralistic type of film with like little uh, 
you learn like, if lessons about what would you do and it has this parents guide for discussion <laughs> on the back like you know you know integrity and um, stuff like that and uh, there's a there's a burger and fry scene in here too that kind of makes you want the same but uh, this has This has uh, an actor that, this is 1991 by the way, but it has an actor that I use a nickname for, I'm for, I'm for Brett Palmer. Brett Palmer is, is just excellent. He's, he's seedy and he's just sleazy. It's like, why did that guy not get any more roles in your wildest dreams? It has nothing to do with the moody blues. But, uh, this is really the only feature films for families movie that I like. I've tried a couple other ones they're not, they're just not as good and they don't, this, just, this one just makes me want to keep coming back every year. Just great. There's Brett Palmer right there. <laughs> He's great. I'm going to mention him again when we get to December. Next is June. June is a very busy month. There's a lot of must-see in June specifically movies. The first one is Red Zone Cuba, 1966. It's just an absolute must-watch with the MST3K commentary. This is where summer is when you start to see a lot of these MST3K films come in. Uh, it's got uh, there's John Carradine in the middle, but he's only in it for, <laughs> for a teeny bit at the beginning. And I just love the scenery in this. It feels like it feels like summer for sure. I just I love this scene. They go into this like weird town there's like a lot of frog legs places <laughs> catfish like this they go into this restaurant and uh this is a um this is a joel hosted right there in the middle mst3k red zone cuba really like this movie yeah i would absolutely love to go here and have some frog legs look at this diner guys Oh yeah, who doesn't want to eat there? Next is Hot Moves. This is um kind of in that area of uh, not quite mid June. I usually watch it at the the last Friday, the last day of schools because the uh, because the movie begins on the last day of school with the uh, rising with the kids finishing their 11th grade year and leaving and going to the beach and then it ends with them uh, on the last day of summer the hot moves 1984 and it really it signifies the beginning of summer All right, next one and usually right after is the girl in lover's lane this is also a joel hosted mst3k one that i fell in love with Maybe five, six years ago. Watch it every year around mid June. Girl in Lover's Lane, 1960. These are always in June, too. Always watch these pretty much back to back. Airplane. And then Airplane 2, which I like better. The sequel. Definitely a must for June. This is like. Often watch the week of like Bible camp, <laughs> sleepaway camp, and like I said earlier, this is the first one along with April Fool's Day that I rented from the video store. And no, 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 not sleepaway camp, slumber party massacre. But I rented this one soon after. Um, yeah, one of my favorites. It's got it's got a great camp atmosphere. I love the uh, I love the baseball scenes. The baseball scene is probably my favorite scene of the whole movie. <laughs> Has nothing to do with any horror or anything, but this is um yeah you you'll always see me posting this as my feature in June. This is another one that I really make an effort to slide into June because at the beginning the Sean Astin's parents are trying to convince him to and Kevin Bacon are trying to convince him to go on this uh summer hiking camp adventure thing with three other boys and so it's definitely a I mean obviously a summer movie 1987 adventure uh, action but just 
kind of drama, but some some funny stuff in here, in here too. I really like. It's a good one also to watch during <laughs> Bible camp. Whitewater summer. July is also extremely busy, maybe even even busier than June. This is one that I can, if I can watch on uh, July the fourth or close to it, the better, because the final part takes place at a theme park on July fourth. This is one that I bought from the video store. One of my favorites. This is one that Slick saw in surround sin surround sound when it came out which meant that the uh, theater like shook and stuff during the the roller coaster scenes but this is, a, this is such a great movie if i can't watch it during july 4th and it can be as late as you know august this is definitely one that i watch every summer uh 1977 also in july we start to get into some twilight zone episodes the first one is nick of time 1960 fortune telling thing there in a in a little diner and I like it not so much for the plot but for the uh the little the small town they go into it's got William Shatner like the little uh car repair shop and just the place that they walk to and the, the little diner there um I like the the diner waiter guy it was kind of like a good red herring so I watched. I definitely watched this. It's, it's and it's uh, they're they're real hot when they're walking through. So it definitely has a summer feel to it. No question about it. Another Twilight Zone episode on Thursday. We leave for home. This is one of those long ones, like one of those fifty minute Twilight Zone episodes. They are. They've been stuck on a planet for years and years. And then I think it's uh, two, uh twenty twenty is when they <laughs> come. They get picked up finally from people from Earth. And I think it's one where there's like two suns and it's just extremely hot on the planet, which is why it fits into July. And I really connect with James Whitmore's character because he's a control freak. I really like this episode. And it's 1963. Tim O'Connor right there is uh, excellent as well. He's the guy that comes on the spaceship that takes them back to Earth. This is one that I like to pick a very, very hot, like, Upper 90s, 100 day to watch the midnight sun. The uh, sun or the earth is moving close to each other and it's like the temperature is just rising and rising. There's no stop to it. It's the perfect episode to watch on a extremely hot July day. Another one usually in July. This is MST3K, the movie. which It's not as good as the... Uh, the TV episodes because they kind of watered it down a little bit, but it's still good for some laughs. And the movie that they watch during the movie, uh, This Island Earth, is it's a good watch on its own. So it has it has some good laughs, and uh, I like the little I like the breaks in between. Some pretty funny stuff in there, and it's only seventy four minutes, so it's a good quick watch. Okay, this is another, um, oh, that was 19, uh, MST3K, that was 1996. And this is another one that's great to watch on a very, very hot day. A good Australian, uh, scenery there, beach scenery, water tower stuff. It's, uh, this is another one that's, it has a similar, has a similar grainy, not grainy, but just that real, cloudy footage like that against all hope and this VHS this is from 1977 uh, and this VHS release was intended to sell copies by putting one of these type of things like Mel Gibson on the front and he's he's in it but he's not the star in it, of it so it's um it's his buddies there but a good Australian Film. I think it might be available on YouTube. Also, you have John Jarrett and uh, Bill Avalon are in this. It's kind of, it's, it's kind of short, like 82 minutes. So a good um, kind of drama uh, uh, suspense, I'd call it. Yeah, I'd call it more like a suspense type of type of film. Gotta watch it every year. So that'll conclude July, and that's 
four and a half months. So we'll pick it up with part two in the next video starting with August. See you then.